Hello and welcome back everyone. The next session, Markets and Smart Money, Fight or Flight, will be moderated by Anand, our Regional Head Equity Research, together with our line of panelists from UOB Asset Management, Maybank Islamic Asset Management, and Abedin Islamic Malaysia. The panel is aimed at providing insights on how institutional smart money is navigating through the many uncertainties faced by capital markets, be it economic, financial, and or geopolitical, that is resulting in sharply heightened volatility between and within asset classes. Topics for discussion will include assessing the impact of interest rates and inflation, as well as rising great power tensions. Again, just a little reminder that if you have any question, please post them on Slido. Without further ado, let us welcome our line of panelists to the stage. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, in the live audience, uh, as well as those of you who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Anand Path McCanton. Uh, I'm the Regional Head of Equity Research for Maybank Investment Banking Group. Uh, welcome to our panel uh, entitled Markets and Smart Money, Fight or Flight. Now in this session, uh, my distinguished panelists and I will endeavor to provide some insights on how institutional smart money is navigating the many uncertainties faced by capital markets currently. Uh, as prior sessions today have expertly articulated, uh, these uncertainties are a combination of economic, financial, geopolitical, and even policy and regulatory factors that have resulted in sharply heightened volatility between and within asset classes. Now today our ideation will center on Malaysia and ASEAN, uh, but no region is an island in today's real, you know, reality of hyper-globalized capital flows. As such, you know, the panelists will also be talking through some global thematics uh, and scenarios uh, in relation to their impact on our region's markets and investment possibilities. Quick reminder that this session is for 75 minutes. The panel discussion will be 50 minutes and we'll follow that with a Q&A session with the audience for about 25 minutes. Now, uh, allow me to introduce our panel for this session. Uh, on my immediate right uh, is Lim Suet Ling, the CEO of UOB Asset Management Malaysia. Uh, on her right is Gerald Ambrose, the CEO of Aberdeen Islamic Malaysia. And on his right is Ridwan Jasmi, the CIO of Maybank Islamic Asset Management. Now, I think it's fair to say that all of us here are grizzled veterans of the many trials and tribulations faced by Malaysia and, and ASEAN as a whole over the last few decades. You know, we've seen it all. We've kept our hair, well, except for Jerry. And, you know, we've been able to sort of come away with a lot of insights, which we hope to share with you today uh, at the, you know, in this session. So the aim is to help you optimize your portfolio positioning, not just to survive the current turmoil, but also to thrive uh, over the long term. So some context setting before we start the Q&A. Uh, I think we've all heard from our expert speakers in earlier sessions on so many issues uh, you know, facing uh, the world today uh, and capital markets, of course, you know, Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, China's policy direction, uh, inflation, interest rates, lockdowns, you know, the list is long and very worrying. 
But there's also some good news for ASEAN. You know, our markets have been outperforming year to date. We've had uh, speakers talk about supply chain relocation to ASEAN, uh, which should be very positive for us structurally uh, over the long term. And of course, valuations uh, after years of relative underperformance are pretty attractive uh, in this part of the world. Um, I think um, you know, the macro panel, uh, moderated by my colleagues who I meet uh, prior to this, has distilled a lot of the global and regional dynamics uh, into the, you know, the key economic challenges and possibilities for Malaysia in particular. But I think those viewpoints and insights are also applicable to ASEAN as a whole. So let's start our discussion you know, with the big picture strategy, uh, and then we'll drill down to some more granular investment considerations. Uh, Swetling, if I could start with you, please. Uh, you know, given all that's happened year to date for economies and markets uh, globally and regionally, uh, you know, we, we would like a picture of how UOB uh, Asset Management's global outlook has changed, say compared to 4Q21 before we, you know, things really got crazy and what you're telling your clients now. Thank you, Anand. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, I think for the beginning of year when we were looking at the global economy as well as the market at the end of last year to start this year, we were actually pretty positive at that time because we were getting out from COVID after two years of lockdown. I mean, we see the supply chain um, bottleneck there, but at the same time, we, we can see demand rising back again and production coming back. Hence, our thinking at that time was it could be a mid-cycle expansion and the economic growth can continue to move for a couple of years more. Unfortunately, we all know what happened. The Ukraine war actually spiked out um, a lot of commodity prices. It's not only oil that we're talking about. We're talking about the food prices as well. We continue to see China locked down um, for a couple of months and again, supply chain get, get affected. So um, the, the scenario has changed now in the sense that inflation becomes stickier, okay? Previously, we were thinking that, oh, if it's just a short-term kind of a supply shock that you can get over when once um, the production starts again. But now, you, because of various reasons globally, um, China, US wall and all those, the, the stickiness of CPI or inflation is there. And we can see it flowing over to um, wages and rental. And once it flows to wages, it's, very, it's going to be there. It's very unlikely that wages will be cut. So going forward, what we are expecting is for inflation to remain high at least to the third quarter or even a little bit towards the fourth quarter before we see it tapering off. So in this case, um, the, when we, we look at the market and Fed um, going through the slowing down in terms of raising interest rate, what we are advising our investor is to be defensive and stay cautious for the time being. Hence, we have actually raised our cash position and in terms of holdings, a little bit more towards the utilities or assets with regular income. Great. So on the inflation side, I mean, we've heard you know, some speakers in the previous uh, panel uh, talk about subsidies potentially being rolled back. And you know, that's clearly going to be a big, another inflation shock, perhaps in this part of the world where <clears throat> you know, we've generally been shielded by a lot of subsidies. So I guess your... Uh, you know, if that was to happen, if we were to roll back fuel subsidies and subsidies for electricity and the CPI starts to move higher, that would also increase your defensive uh, sort of perspective on the market? No, I think um, definitely we believe CPI will remain quite at the elevated level for the time being. So um, either the supply increase or the demand has to reduce, right? Right. But just that when if demand were to reduce, it also means economic slowdown. So there must be an equilibrium. So we would rather be cautious on, a little bit cautious and, yeah, a little bit cautious and uh, look at the economics number closely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Swetling. Jerry, if I could move on to you. So Aberdeen is known for many things, but one of its, uh, you know, core tenets, so to speak, is its buy and hold strategy. You, know, you guys really stick to your stocks. 
uh, through thick and thin uh, in your portfolios. You know, that's paid off well, you know, over the last two decades, you know, the market's been very good generally, globally. But, you know, is this time different? Is this sell-off different? Or is it something where you're telling your clients, let's double down on existing positions and build them up? Uh, good afternoon and uh, good afternoon, everybody who's listening virtually from all over ASEAN. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here and those who are listening in person. Um, uh, yes, you're right. Aberdeen is a sort of long-term bottom-up fundamental investor and we spend most of our revenues. Uh, market price of Aberdeen shares indicates too much of our revenues, uh, paying fund managers to go and uh, visit companies to find out those that uh, have a competitive advantage, strong balance sheet, excess free cash flow that they might pay as dividend, uh, uh, and the, the management is honest. And recently, you know, there's a large ESG influence. We've always been into governance since we started to become a pure fund management company in the uh, mid 80s. But uh, in terms of uh, climate change, uh, it was pretty clear in the middle of last century, so by in the mid 90s, that uh, the world's getting warmer. I think even Jeremy Clarkson, uh, uh, Donald Trump is going to acknowledge that things are a bit warmer. So we have to look at companies and find out if the management has looked at the risks and opportunities of uh, climate change on, on their future plans. But yeah, I think we are in a new paradigm completely. Um, really, since 87, the developed world governments, and I'm not really talking about the uh, uh, central banks of uh, the likes of Malaysia, ASEAN, uh, is really UK, Europe, US, and Japan. These central banks have uh, used policies of interest rates to uh, stimulate an economy when it's slowing. In fact, sometimes they're more sensitive about the movement of the capital markets than they are to the movements of uh, you know, uh, unemployment, et cetera. Um, and then in 2007, when the global financial crisis came, uh, uh, they decided also to carry out quantitative easing, which is basically printing money, which went into bank accounts and was available for uh, companies that were able to borrow and banks that were willing to lend uh, to, to stimulate the economy. Uh, and this led to massive asset price inflation. There was inflation, but it was inflation of asset prices. And those who had the assets at the beginning, the rich, uh, got richer. Uh, those who didn't have it, it didn't really affect them at all. And this stimulus was able to take place since 1987 through to really 2021 uh, without inflation. It didn't happen. And I think what, what led to this inflation was when COVID came, uh, these central banks ramped up their pumping of liquidity and asset acquisitions. Their balance sheet expanded by another, I think it was $8 trillion US dollars in the case of uh, the United States. And when people were sent home, you know, they couldn't work and the economy stalled. Basically, if the government breaks it, they, they've got to make good. So they basically credited ordinary people's accounts with cash. Yeah. Didn't happen here so much, unfortunately, but it did happen to many people uh, uh, all over the developed world. And if you get cash for nothing, spend it. In fact, they didn't want to go back to work when they could go back to work because they were earning more uh, in terms of subsidies than they were. So when the money gets sprayed into bank accounts and it doesn't get lent out, you're not going to get inflation. And that happened between 87 and 2020. But then when the money went from the bank accounts or from the government directly into people's bank accounts, then they go down to Walmart, then they go down to you know, uh, uh, wherever they can, uh, uh, Lazada or buy everything online. And uh, that leads to massive inflation. And that's the big change uh, that is going to be very difficult to overcome. And I think I saw Boris Johnson, who narrowly survived a vote of confidence yesterday, but he was saying that he's going to give £1,200 to all households in the UK to help offset their electricity bill. Well, maybe it will, but they'll spend it. Uh, so, you know, and we've got oil prices going up again overnight. So I think this inflation is, is going to be quite sticky. So uh, that means that you have to look at things in a, in, in a different way. Uh, and we still believe that uh, it's very difficult to have an asset allocation uh, when everything is going down. And this happened in the first half of this year, bonds, equities, uh, 
fine wines, and everything uh, went down, uh, apart from, I think, residential property and a lot of uh, developed markets. So we keep a pretty neutral weight between equities, bonds, I think we're slightly overweight real estate, uh, and we have quite a lot of gold, but uh, it's just, if you, if you get rid of certain things, and this hike in interest rates that's happened when the economy came out of COVID, and obviously it was nice to see here uh, at the Deputy Governor of Bank Nagara earlier saying, you know, we remain accommodative. It, it's not a problem. We're not that far behind. We will remain so. But in, in the US uh, and in the rest of the world, I think the central banks are way behind the level of economic activity. And they've been way too accommodative. And to be honest, what have they done? I think they've raised rates by either 75 or 50 basis points so far. There's lots of talk about them raising in the future, but the economy is still going pretty strongly and the credibility of the Federal Reserve is at stake at the moment. If they decide to uh, uh, stop, uh, quant stop raising interest rates and reducing the balance sheet before inflation is killed, that their credibility is shot. So, that's the difference. In the past, there's always been this uh, Federal Reserve put, and when the markets fell too far, interest rates would come down and more liquidity would arrive. This time, I think they've got to kill inflation, not just make it come off, but make it crater. So this will go on, there'll be quite a lot of pain for quite a long time, I think. Well, it does sound like inflation is a recurring theme uh, here. And you know, what you're talking about, you know, creating the economy to bring inflation down if, you know, by raising rates very high. What's your personal view of interest rates you know, in, in this part of the world, say Malaysia, do you, do you think we're behind the curve or do you think that, you know, we, uh, the moderate path we're, we're, you know, tracing right now is something we can actually pull off? It's, um, you remember that movie Apollo 13 when uh, uh, they lost control of the landing craft and Tom Hanks had to manually guide uh, the aircraft to the right angle. It's almost impossible. And I think that uh, the developed world has got to try and find its way through uh, inflation and economic slowdown or even recession and guide it through. It's, it's almost impossible. Somebody said it's a bit like riding two horses with one ass, to be, to be frank. But uh, in the case of uh, Malaysia, I don't think we have that inflation problem. I don't know whether interests are the cure for the inflation problem to some extent. We have got a recovery in demand. We have got higher prices, but I think that we can edge up interest rates in a gradual way and retain economic health. And in fact, we're in, I'm not saying domestic demand is great. It seems to be recovering now that we've opened up, but in terms of current account, we're still in surplus. In terms of trade, we're uh, still strongly in surplus. We have very strong parts of the economy. We benefit from higher commodity prices. I think we're in good state. The, the key thing is to, to make sure that the ordinary Malaysian does well. And I think that will be done by perhaps gradual increases in interest rates. And our economy isn't quite so ridiculously out of kilter as uh, the Western worlds are. Thanks for that, Jerry. So pockets of strength, and we'll revisit that in a, in a question later on. Can I move on to uh, Ridwan? So, you know, on Sharia investing, you know, that's been a strong growth story for many years now. You know, huge success story globally, especially for Malaysia. Uh, you know, but the, the huge growth in Sharia assets globally and performance as well has come at a time of, you know, uh, almost unbroken decline in interest rates. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's been a driver of that growth, but what's clear now is interest rates are inflecting and they're starting to move up. How, how does that make Sharia investing uh, uh, look to the future? Is it going to be more difficult or is it actually quite good for Sharia investing? Thank you very much, Thank you very much Anand. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, before I go on to the uh, answer, I mean, sitting up here, um, I noticed one thing among the panelists here. If you notice, uh, the other two panelists are still using paper and pens, and I'm the only one using digital <laughs> devices. So that clearly shows, you know, in terms of age gap where we stand. <laughs> I think you're the youngest here, so <laughs> don't rub it in. <laughs> okay, uh, to the question, you know, if you look at from the interest rate point of view, um, I would say that, you know, the low interest rate environment 
is one of the main factors that has driven a lot of asset classes to the new high, not necessarily on the Sharia space only, but if you can see, you know, even in the conventional space on the alternative assets, for example, the Bitcoins, the cryptos and whatnot, interest rate is one of the determinant factors when it comes to the growth of all these asset classes. So when it comes to Sharia, there are other factors that has drive or driven the, 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 the growth for Sharia related investment. Uh, for example, if you look at the, uh, the trends that we have right now, the growth in Sharia asset has been growing at teens percent per annum now, although it's, it's quite low or, or relatively low as compared to what we used to have in the Sharia space growth of about 20% or 30%, but you must understand that over the years, the base has becoming bigger and bigger. So despite teens uh, percentage of growth, uh, it's still decent and, and moving into the right directions. So I guess the growth for Sharia is, is basically driven by a few factors. One of it is actually the increasing awareness about Sharia investing among the Muslims, because we do have about 1.8 billion Muslims across the globe. And, and that is one of the key factors that has drive uh, the, the, the demand for the investment, uh, Sharia investment. The other factors that I, if I can pinpoint is actually the performance itself. You know, uh, looking at the overall performance number for some of the Sharia related products, be it equities, mixed asset, or, or suku, uh, in that, uh, or suku, you know, performance numbers has been decent. In fact, if you look at the three and five years performance of some of the global indices, for example, the MSCI World, Islamic and MSCI World, uh, you can see that uh, the Islamic uh, benchmark actually outperformed the conventional uh, benchmark. So this is another factor that has made uh, investment becoming an attractive investment solutions, not only for the Muslims, but for also for the other uh, faith. Uh, the other point that I would like to touch is actually in terms of the, uh, the demand coming from the institutional. Uh, in Malaysia perspective, you know, you can see a lot of demands coming from the corporates, the uh, pension funds, and this will definitely help to drive the growth uh, for the Sharia investing in, in Malaysia. A uh, couple of years back, you know, EPF uh, did uh, move towards a full 100% Sharia uh, accounts. And, and this has basically helped to create more awareness among the Muslims here in Malaysia. And, and most importantly, it becomes the first pension fund in the world to do so. And then you have the likes of Co-op, uh, who's continuously you know, promoting the Islamic agenda, uh, Tabung Haji, UJSB, uh, non-stop you know, promoting the, the Islamic agenda or Islamic finance agenda in Malaysia. So that basically has helped in terms of the growth of the sector or the growth of the Islamic investment. The last point that I want to highlight here is that actually, if you look at the Sharia investing uh, and the demand for SRI or ESG, that has basically opened up another channel for, for the Sharia investing. Why I did say uh, why I say so is because if you look at there are some similarities when it comes to Sharia investing and also SRI and ESG, you know points like you know uh, Sharia promoting the social economic justice and overall well being that is being covered under the SRI and ESG. Although uh, we have to admit that you know under the ESG the scope would be much bigger as compared to the Sharia. So that has basically increased the credentials of Sharia investing with the push uh, among the market players towards SRI and also the ESG. So to the next question, whether, you know, in the environment where rising interest rate, would Sharia investing still be uh, uh, solid or still be positive? I, I would say that we have to stick back, take a step back and understand Sharia investing from the screening point of view, if you look at the Sharia uh, investing or Sharia screening, 
there are two categories, two main categories. One is actually the, the industry itself, where you know you have to screen for all the non-permissible uh, activities, for example, gambling and whatnot. But the, uh, the second part of the screening is, is very interesting. It is where the screening focuses on the asset quality and the overall sustainability of the company. Where you know on the second part, you will be looking at the debt level, the leverage to make sure that you know the company doesn't over leverage and, and doing and taking derivatives instrument or whatnot. So that for me is a crucial part of the Islamic screening. Why? It's because you know, in the event of any financial shock. Or, or a shock to the economy or shock to the financial se sector, this would be one of the key things that would have uh, to, to protect the volatility when it comes to Sharia investing. So I guess, uh, Anand, to your question, whether interest rate would play an important role in the development of the Sharia, yes. But I guess over in the long run, Sharia provides much more resilience when it comes to investment solutions. So that's, a, that's an excellent point, actually. I never thought of it that way that, you know, the inbuilt screening in Sharia investing does provide a lot of buffers against crisis issues like shooting, you know, interest rates shooting up or, or inflationary issues. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Now, let, let's bring the discussion closer to home, you know, to, to ASEAN. So, you know, equity markets in this part of the world have been relatively resilient. You know, in fact, Indonesia, Singapore benchmarks are up in absolute terms year to date. And some other, other ASEAN benchmarks, uh, clear relative outperformers versus North Asia and their Western or developed world counterparts. Jerry, let me, let me start with you. you know, has, has, been, has this relative outperformance been a surprise to you, you know, for ASEAN outperforming in this way? Well, no, I've been in Malaysia since 1990. So that's uh, 33 years. When you had uh, actually, the ponytail. Yeah. yeah, I had hair when I first came here. <laughs> Uh, but uh, actually, the surprise is that uh, I was surprised that uh, Malaysia and ASEAN hadn't outperformed in the periods when it underperformed. You know, uh, I, I think maybe over the, that sort of 33 years I've been here, when I first came here, I remember people saying uh, uh, in the Asia X Japan index, Malaysia weight was 26 percent. Uh, and then suddenly... China became investable, India became investable, Taiwan became investable, Korea became investable, Vietnam, uh, some Indo-Chinese economies became investable. Uh, uh, and we, found us, we find ourselves now at, I think, slightly over 2%. So our weight is tiny. So a lot of it is not attributable to our complete shrinkage. It's the relative size of the pie that's got bigger. And I was just thinking, uh, having heard other people, that you know, this year... Malaysia could grow between five and a half and six and a half percent, according to Bank Negara, uh, or is it the Ministry of Finance? I can't remember which of the two forecast that. Uh, that's, that's higher than China. I can't remember when Malaysia's economic growth will be higher than that of China. Uh, and Malaysia's, China's growth doesn't look that good at the moment. They're, they're absorbing a lot of big problems. Uh, they, they've stuck to this zero COVID policy. Uh, the property market has uh, gone pretty sick. There have been some small measures to try and stimulate it. But at the end of the day, the age profile of China is pretty horrible. And, you know, economic growth down the road is going to be more difficult to achieve. Uh, you know, that one child policy has really uh, started to uh, affect them. Uh, whereas ASEAN as an economy, uh, everybody's always said as a cliche, it's sort of 660 million people. Uh, and they're all that their age profiles are a lot more healthy. I know that I know that Malaysia's will will start to age officially from 2030 uh, onwards. But uh, I do think that that dramatic growth has always been there, uh, and uh, we can recover from crises much more quickly than other people can. I think if you take China out of the Asia X Japan index and reweight Malaysia's weight, it goes up to around about seven or eight percent. I think that could, could, could easily happen. And then also, as you say, I'm just looking at the prospective price earnings ratio for ASEAN uh, for this year. It's 14.8 uh, times, according to some estimates. That's about slightly over one standard deviation below its average for the past 10 years. Uh, and the price to book is one and a half times, which is uh, slightly less than uh, uh, one standard deviation below its average for the year. Uh, so, you know, I, I think... If you look at ASEAN's performance against Asia, Japan, it looks 
a little bit better. Uh, if you look at Malaysia's against uh, uh, ASEAN, it's still looking pretty bad. Uh, I'm just thinking there's nobody left from overseas to sell this market. We're down to around about 20% weight. Um, and people starting to wobble a little bit about ESG. At one stage, people thought, you know, uh, palm oil plantations equals dead orang utans, purely evil. Uh, and then suddenly, strangely enough, when the palm oil price went from 3,000 to 8,000 ringgit, uh, everybody forgot about those principles and they, they poured into it whilst local institutions were actually selling. So I, I think that there's a, a big upside to a number of areas of this market where we have particular competitive advantage. Uh, electronics manufacturing is another one. This is just for Malaysia, but ASEAN as a whole, uh, and people were talking about RCCEP early, earlier. Uh, I'm trying to write down the acronyms now. I don't think it was PTPTN, was it? Or NKVE? Or uh, ACLE, I can't remember. But uh, you know, there are many trade agreements within ASEAN. And if we work more together so that we can combine our joint strengths as one economy, uh, I think that ASEAN will sort of refine its place uh, as a much more prominent player in the market. Well, it sounds like you're positive, yeah, uh, medium long term on ASEAN. So you do bring up an interesting point with plantations. You know, I, I always worry, yeah, punishments are hot right now. You know, foreigners who said before they wouldn't touch it have been buying as well. You know, they've been sort of compelled to buy with the CPO prices going up. But it all feels kind of short term, right? You know, plantations will still be the bad guy once Ukraine, Russia is over and you know, oil seed supply normalizes. So is there really a structural story here for, for, the, for Malaysia or for the region? Or is it all tactical? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a, quite a lot of hypocrisy in the whole ESG thing that is now starting to come to light. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you look at deforestation of the world over the past five years, it, it's, it's relatively moderate in Indonesia and Malaysia, particularly in Malaysia, uh, whereas it's really in the Amazon basin, we're replanting of a soybean that is the real culprit, but they have a better sort of PR system. I think looking at general numbers, uh, something like 4% of the Earth's surface is planted to edible oils. And that's, you know, palm oil, uh, uh, sunflower oil, uh, uh, all the uh, rapeseed oil, soybean oil. Uh, and of that 4%, only 7% is planted to palm oil. But palm oil accounts for 35% of total edible oil supply. So in terms of efficiency, actually, yeah. once it's RSP approved and it's sustainable, I think palm oil is in fact green. And... Just talking about hypocrisy, I think just the other day, the Chancellor of Germany, he's some new guy, I can't remember his name, but he was saying that, uh, you know, he acknowledges there's going to be a gap between uh, Putin turning off the gas and oil pipes uh, and th their ability to create renewable energy. And in the meantime, he's going to be having to rely on opening up a few coal mines. He shut all his in in nuclear mines, but right. sort of yeah. implying that... Uh, coal is ESG compliant. And then uh, another big American house is forecasting that, uh, or saying that uh, weapons manufacturers should be ESG compliant because they're not offensive, they're defensive. And they can still kill people. It doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of hypocrisy when the greed starts to take over from fear. So uh, I think Malaysia has actually done the best job it could, uh, but our PR on, on palm oil, we need to go out and tell people you know, what we're doing to, to make it sustainable. Yeah, good point. I mean, there's a window for this right now. You know, a lot of rules are being bent to suit the circumstances of the world. And uh, yeah, there's a window for us to make the case again for oil palm, which we haven't done so well, I guess, previously. Ridwan, let me move to you. I mean, you know, Sharia investing as a segment, you know, has it been able to capture this relative outperformance that ASEAN has been demonstrating? And, you know, are there any sort of uh, products in particular in that space that would allow investors to capture this outperformance? Obviously, uh, as alluded by Jerry, uh, we, in ASEAN, we are blessed with a lot of natural resources. For example, likes of Malaysia, we do have a lot of oil and gas uh, plantations. Um, and we, if you go to our closest neighbors, Indonesia, um, you know, they have nickel, they have a lot of other resources as well. You know, in, that has basically helped ASEAN in terms of outperforming uh, the other regions when it comes to uh, uh, overall performance year to date. You know, um, if I can go a bit in terms of granulars, if you look at the Morgan Stanley MSCI, 
Islamic Asian Index is basically clearly shows that you know it has outperformed the conventional uh, Asian uh, index. Uh, for example, in a, the Islamic Index is up by about seven percent year to date, but as if you compare that to the conventional, it's only up by five uh, percent this year. Again, uh, basically driven by the natural resources, commodities uh, space uh, that we have in ASEAN. If you look at into the bigger picture, uh, MSCI Asia Pacific is the same trend over for the three and five years performance. Uh, again, it was basically the last three and five years was basically driven by the, the, um, the technology sectors and also some of the commodities that we have uh, over in Asia Pacific. Uh, for Malaysia, uh, interestingly, um, if you dissect the performance of Bursa Malaysia sector by sector, you know, there's no surprise that actually the plantation sectors has been performing relatively well this year. So the last number that I looked at, uh, the plantation sector is up by almost 25 to 27% for this year. So that basically helps uh, in terms of the overall performance of Bursa. Although Bursa, in general, the number is still yet neg negative year to date, but you know, plantation sectors has basically you know, outshined or outperformed the, 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 uh, the FBM KLCI and also FBM uh, IMAS to a certain extent. In terms of uh, the product development for ASEAN, I, I guess I have to go back to my earlier point. You know, when it comes to the time when we do have a low interest rate environment, that has been a futile ground for the de developments of a lot of products in the market, you know, be it conventional and also Sharia. One of the area that we in Maybank, we have started the ball rolling is actually on the quant side. So I guess this is one of the area where, you know, uh, in Maybank, we have fully integrated, fully integrate a team out of our uh, a subsidiary in Singapore to really, really build up our capacity and capability when it comes to quant. So these are one of the area where I believe that, you know, when it comes to Sharia investing specifically for Asia and also in Malaysia, this is one of the area where we will pursue and, and put our focus on. Great. Hey, thanks. Thank you, Ridwan. Swetling, I'm going to ask you the same question I sort of asked Jerry just now. You know, ASEAN is having its moment in the sun right now. You know, people are looking at the region again. We're seeing foreign inflows, uh, indexes are outperforming. But, you know, I guess investors want to know, is this just a trade or have things really changed for ASEAN finally in a structural manner where we can expect multi-year gains, not just a situational gain for, for investors in this region? Yeah, I think... From here, from Malaysia itself, right? And uh, I believe the rest of your participants in this region, the majority of us are within, within ASEAN itself. So I guess we, we ourselves can feel the vibrancy in, in our economy and the potential here. Going back to what Jerry said earlier on, at that time, Malaysia, Singapore, um, when you, Indonesia and Thailand, we were known as the Tigers. The, the Asian Tigers, the ASEAN Tigers, or the Tiger Cups itself. And Jerry, Jerry correctly pointed out that in the early 1990s, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand, our, our market cap and, and liquidity was so high. That's because Korea, Taiwan, and China, the three markets are actually closed. They were closed economy or the market were not closed. So in a way, yes, we were affected or we shrank the last couple of years. Um, but what is for ASEAN in the long term? In the short term, as you rightly pointed out, you know, we have our commodities, we, are, uh, we have our plantation itself, we have our oil and gas, and valuation is cheap. Very valuation is cheap because all the investors has grown, has actually gone to the northern side, which is high growth and forgotten about us, which is value. But we look upon ASEAN differently. In a, in not, we don't feel that it's a blip because there are long-term trends that we believe is supportive of ASEAN. And let's go through by going through the first is the population. If you were to look at ASEAN as one economy, we are the fourth largest in the world. We have a population of 600 over million, right? That's including Vietnam and the rest. We're not talking about the Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand now, Vietnam and Indonesia. We have a young population and educated population. 
which is good in the long term. Secondly, we have manufacturing. I mean, we know about the supply chain bottleneck. We know about the US-China trade war itself. And with COVID, there, there is definitely a shift, a diversification, and we are here to actually benefit it. I think Malaysia, we are already feeling it, you know, especially on the electronic side. And third is definitely still the FDIs because we are relatively cheap compared to China. So the FDI continue to be here, we believe, for diversification. The fourth that we can see is the slight change in our, our market. Okay, hopefully we can see more internet unicorn appearing here or being listed here. Then you can see even more interest back to our economy beside the old um, banks itself that, that definitely benefited during the this interest rate hike where your NIMS margin will actually broaden. And uh, finally, like, like we have mentioned, the RCEP itself is one of the best um, trade agreement that we can do, is how can we actually benefit and collaborate together. So it can have a long-term effect here, and we do be, believe that there are opportunities. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's a very good list of uh, you know, sort of structural positives. Just uh, one Martin. thing oh, that I just suddenly struck You had me. to interrupt. There, go yeah. on. I had uh, my spiel. Uh, that but, uh, I hadn't thought about before, but this decline of Malaysia's weight from 26% to just over 2% from 1993 to 2022, um, that has been exacerbated by the rise of uh, the passive investing market, exchange-traded funds. And exchange-traded funds view assets through the lenses of, you know, they pick the biggest, most liquid stocks with the largest public float. Um, these three factors don't actually look at quality of companies or transparency or honesty of companies at all. And I think structurally, not yet, because there's still net subscriptions of ETFs all, all over the world, but uh, I think structurally, maybe people might start to realize that actually being a bit more selective in what you're buying rather than just buying a basket of a country uh, is more important. So this relative weight won't matter so much and people will buy where the growth is and where the, 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 the uh, structural opportunity is. And I think that's probably more in ASEAN than China over the next year or two. The famous last words, but that's what I think. I mean, you're both, I mean, all three of you are experts in active investing. And I guess, you know, ASEAN still remains a very uh, attractive region for that. You know, if you, if you get that right, you can make outsized returns for sure. Now, let me move on to, uh, I think we're a bit behind on time. But, you know, asset classes, all right, we talk a lot about equities, uh, different sectors within equities, but really what really decides a portfolio's return is the asset class you're weighted in, much more so than what you buy within that asset class, generally speaking. Uh, and it is, in this part of the world, that really boils down to equities versus bonds. You have some exotics, you know, you have, you have crypto in there, and you may have, you know, BC and stuff like that, but those are not really investable for most investors at this point in time. So let's focus on equities versus bonds. You know, really, I just wanted to get a feel on, in the Sharia space or in the Sukuk space, how has you know, Islamic fixed income been performing compared to conventional, given this complete change in outlook for interest rates and all the volatility we've seen? Um, if you look at interest rate relationship, relationship to any of the fixed income types of products, not necessarily being Sukuk, but also the, the bond side. Of course, the obvious uh, relationship would be, you know, for every time that there's an in increase in interest rate, there will be a negative adjustment to the, uh, to the fixed income type of products. And, and in this space, of course, Suko would not be spied. Uh, but what we need to see in detail is that the volatility, the different in terms of volatility when it comes to the adjustment to the conventional bonds and also to the Suko. Uh, if I can put it into numbers, if you look at the, uh, the World Bond Index versus the Suku Index, it's very clear that you know, the adjustment uh, or the performance of the Suku has been much more resilient as compared to the, the conventional space. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the number is uh, the, the correction for the Suku market is down by about 6% as compared to the conventional bond, which is down by 10%. So that basically shows the resiliencies in terms of uh, Sukuk performance versus the uh, conventional. 
Why is that so? I guess it goes back to the overall principle of this Sharia, which is basically focuses in terms of the sectors, the sectors exposure, and also in terms of the asset quality and, and, and how robust it is when it comes to the overall operations and also the balance sheets. Uh, Suku has been a very interesting market uh, from the asset allocation point of view, like mentioned by uh, Anand. No, it started way, way long time ago. You know, there's always this uh, uh, argument in terms of the Sharia principle applies uh, between the Middle East and also some of the scholars here in Malaysia. But once we get over that stage, you can see the development or the growth of the Sukuk market globally has been tremendous. Just take a simple uh, uh, number uh, coming out of the MENA market, the Middle East and North Asia. You know, a couple of years back, 2006, the total number of debt issuance in MENA was only about 300 over million or 200 over million US dollar. But the latest number that I can remember is that it's close to about half a trillion dollar. And if you look at the overall outstanding bonds issuance in the world right now, it is amounted to about 800 billion US dollar and is expected to be to reach about 1 trillion uh, in, in by year 2025. That is actually, for me, is testament in terms of the importance of uh, the Sukuk market when it comes to the overall asset allocation, especially when investment, uh, Sharia investing has become the mainstream investment solutions, uh, uh, in the main, has become the mainstream investment solution for everyone in this globe. And in Malaysia's perspective, you look at the, the, the Sukuk space, you, know, you can see now in terms of issuance or the issuer itself, you know, it has become a more diversified, there's a more diversified in terms of names of the issuer and also the sectors that are willing to go into the suku space. Uh, if previously we only have the infra players, you know, willing to go into the suku space, but now, you know, we do have a lot of other sectors that are exploring in terms of suku issuance. And I think that is a positive development in Malaysia. And I would, I would think that, you know, uh, over in the long run, we could see that you no know, more issuer coming from the regional space willing to explore Suku as one of their funding options. That's good to know. Thanks, thanks, Rion. Uh, uh, Swetling, on on you know when you talk to your clients now, I mean, do you tell them what the party in bonds is over? You know, don't buy that stuff anymore. I mean, what's changed in the last six months in terms of your allocation advice to clients between equities and bonds? Yeah, I think the there is always this question whether is bond still relevant, right? With interest right. rate rising. Okay, in UOB asset management, we believe that um, you need a balanced portfolio, okay? And what, what can bonds actually offer you is stable, predictable income. And if you, have, if you don't have any credit risk, you get back your principal. And at this juncture, after the, the, all those hikes in interest rate, you can get pretty good bonds at, Four to five percent yield, if you are willing to hold it. So we do believe that uh, bond still has a a place in terms of your asset allocation, but you can be more selective on what, where you want to invest in. Yeah. I mean, if we've talked a lot about inflation, that's you know enemy number one for bonds. And if it did surprise on the upside, would, would your advice be changing accordingly to to be less weighted in bonds, or would, would you still say uh, a significant amount of your portfolio should still be in bonds? I think it all depends on at which stage of the life cycle you are, whether as an individual or from the organization point. Because bonds definitely give you the stability and the certainty as compared to equity. So we continue to have a place for bonds. To be very honest, when we look at our bond portfolio, we have two funds um, that is invested regionally. What we have is a very short-term fund with about two to three months kind of um, duration. So we try to keep the duration short, okay? We have two, three months portfolio, or we have another bond fund that is 1.5 years kind of duration, and yet it's given, giving us better than um, savings or FD rates, yeah. Hey. Gary, what about you? you know, what are you telling clients about you know, their portfolios and how they should be weighted between equities and bonds? Uh, just purely through between equities and bonds, um, I've looked at our strategic asset allocation between those two 
discrete assets, and it hasn't changed that much. I think right. we started the year a bit overweight in equities uh, and a bit underweight in bonds, and uh, we've cut back our weighting in equities. So it is, uh, I think it's around about 60, 40, actually. Um, but those two, Scylla and Charybdis, or whatever you, you were talking about, and that's uh, inflation and growth. You know, inflation is really high in the developed world at the moment. I think the last count in uh, the UK was 9%. It's 8.3% right. in uh, the US. Uh, and the credibility of the Federal Reserves and the central banks is rests upon them killing that debt, not just bringing it down to six. They want to get it down to two. Okay. So that means that they're likely to keep raising interest rates, keep being hawkish, hike, hike, hike. But eventually... And it's happening already. People start to worry about growth or even recession. If you keep the best cure for higher prices is higher prices, and suddenly it all turns over, uh, and then the the threat changes a little bit. And if economic growth slows or there's a recession, then people start to move into the long end of the bond market. And I know that our fixed income guys are switching duration. I'm not an expert at all this, but they're buying the long end. Uh, because they do see economic growth slowing significantly and slower economic growth normally leads to short end maybe rising, but the, the, the long end falling. So uh, that, that's one thing that's happening. And the other area where we've changed our sort of asset allocation is, is tactically, I suppose. So within equities, uh, we own a, a bit more conservative stuff uh, and uh, less growth. Uh, and within bonds, I know we've got a lot of uh, you know, UK and US high-grade corporate uh, and in real estate, uh, uh, there's quite a lot of difference. But the area of the real change has been outside equities and bonds. Uh, and, and the other assets that are not allocated to each other uh, and have got very little co correlation with, with each other uh, as where we've seen the growth. Because we've seen equities going down, bonds going down in the first half of the year. And so the balanced portfolio has been a disaster. Uh, but there are things like uh, I've just seen in our, we have a thing called Diversified Growth Fund, we had a huge chunk of uh, uh, music royalties. You know, apparently during COVID, uh, the collection of Elton John's records didn't lose its value at all. Hmm. You know, uh, and then you've got uh, battery storage, uh, uh, renewable energy. And there are many alternatives. And of course, gold. <clears throat> Chris Wood, who is the, the writer of Greed and Fear and has been since, I think, 1988. Uh, he's now got in his global portfolio of all assets... 45% in gold, that's 25% in gold pure, 20% in gold mining stocks, 5% in Bitcoin, and the balance in a, a selection of bonds and uh, you know, not much equity. So <clears throat> it all depends on you know, whether you can look outside equities and bonds. And you know, in those kind of asset classes like gold, uh, music, Alton John, as you mentioned, I mean, for investors who want to have access to those kind of assets, it's can it be done individually or do you have to go through funds which specialize in, in those, those kind of exposures? Well, gold, you can. Uh, as soon as this uh, session is over, I'm going to put my earrings back on. <laughs> I might not put my nipple rings on until a bit later, but, you know, gold will be about my person. Uh, uh, and, and, of course, you know, there are licensed, SC licensed uh, uh, exchanges for I think it's called Luna for, 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 for Bitcoin, etc. Yeah. That's yeah. for the individual level. But uh, the easiest way, or perhaps the, 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 the best way of getting pure diversification are, are a number of funds. We have a global uh, uh, risk mitigation asset that is actually it's a joint venture with Bank BNP Paribas, uh, and it's uh, listed, but you can buy assets in that really behave in an adverse way to equity, equity markets. Oh, okay. uh, and then there's a diversified growth fund that has all these investments and things like Elton John's music, et cetera, that give you that diversification. Okay, that's great to know. Now let's focus on equities a little bit. This is the second last uh, question for you guys. So let's start with UOB, you know, uh, with its uh, Asia and ASEAN focus. Uh, for equity performance this year, you know, we've talked about inflation. What other thematics or drivers do you think investors should you know, stay in touch with uh, in terms of driving equity performance in this part of the world? I think, like I mentioned earlier on inflation, most probably we got to still stick with it for a couple of months more. So um, in the short term, it will still be commodities, um, oil and gas that we look into. 
but definitely we are interested in ASEAN to look at the travel itself because as the economy moves, the travel related stocks, um, medical, we see a lot of medical uh, related kind of travel here beside the, um, the hotels already related itself. Yeah. So this, this will be area that we're looking at in terms of growth. Um, in, when we look at it, we, we look at ASEAN as a region that you don't only look at the big caps. There is a lot of undiscovered gems in the smaller cap stock. When we talk about market cap earlier on, that's the reason why ASEAN has grown smaller, right? Right, yes. Compared to the rest. But it also means that when you are smaller, there are opportunities as well that you can really go and discover the, the smaller cap stocks in this region. Yeah. And definitely with Vietnam, as we all know, the ASEAN, each market can speak their own language. If you are in Thailand, it's best if you can speak Thai, sure. right? So same as for Vietnam, um, maybe Indonesia, most probably Indonesia as well, except Sing Malaysia that you tend to speak in. So having people on the ground does make a lot of difference when you want to go to, into this market and we will want to be able to ride it when it's small. Uh, you know, when, when we talk about all this small cap stock, I just, I just recall, nowadays we are all very used to Uniqlo, right? Yep. And Uniqlo is of course listed. But when I first bought my first Uniqlo, do you know that was 30 years ago? 30 years ago, because I have a colleague that is covering the Japan market. Okay, so when they cover Japan market, it, it was really listed at that time. So, so but, but for me, it's the product that I'm used to. But now Uniqlo has actually come to this part of the world. But if you go back and see how much Uniqlo has grown from then to now, then that's, that's where we want to be able to capture the growth of the undiscovered undervalued stocks in ASEAN itself. Any uh, small cap names you want to share with the audience? <laughs> the next Uniqlo maybe? For... <laughs> no, we don't share names, but if you want to know, we, we do have two um, ASEAN funds within uh, UOBA, and we, want, we have one that is big cap, and it actually generates a return about 7 8% the last couple of years, above the benchmark about 5%. We have one small cap related, we call it Discovery, ASEAN Discovery, and the annualized return for the last three years is uh, about 11%. If you were to look at the smaller cap benchmark, it's pretty flattish, about 1-2%. Okay. Yeah. So significant outperformance there. Jerry, let me, let me come to you. Now, European funds, you know, at the forefront of ESG investing, I think you were out hugging trees last week or something, you mentioned your WhatsApp to me. What do you think about the ESG investability scenario in ASEAN? Do you find a lot of opportunities here? or ESG investing or SRI investing? Yes, I do. Um, a lot of it, I think, might still be in the private equity space. Right. You know, a lot of uh, projects and uh, uh, moves. And remember, Malaysia still sources, I think, 30 to 40% of its electricity from coal-fired, a lot of it from gas-fired. Not a lot of it is uh, renewable at the moment. That, that, that switch has to take place. Solar energy geothermal energy, wind power energy, uh, are all becoming much more efficient. And there has to be a massive investment for that switch to take place. And some of that can be done through uh, public listed companies. Uh, but I think there are you know, huge, no less opportunities here and no less amount of money that needs to be spent to uh, uh, make the transition than, than, than any other markets. Uh, I would say that the overall perception of ESG over the past six months has taken a bit of a beating for, for reasons I mentioned before that, uh, you know, maybe people's greed takes over from their principles occasionally and they suddenly find that uh, weapons manufacturers are acceptable or, uh, you know, uh, palm oil, uh, which was uh, a, a non-investable suddenly becomes investable when the price goes up. Uh, and I think there was a guy called Jared Dillion who's a sort of pundit saying that um, ESG is a luxury we can only afford during peacetime. You know, th that is a, a feeling that, you know, with war, or I think the Russians call it their, their special military operation in uh, Ukraine, uh, has led to real risk for, you know, 
energy supply in, 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 in Europe, places like Germany. Um, so do you really want people to, if, the, if this war goes on till winter, I don't think the renewable energy will be there to replace the gas and the uh, oil that uh, Russia currently is a dominant supplier of. Uh, you've got a nasty dilemma. Do you switch to fossil fuel or maybe restart nuclear? Or do you uh, uh, let people do more press ups and you know try and stay warm uh, through that method? You know, there's a, a non sequitur. It doesn't make sense. And right. that guy, um, John Kerry, I don't think he's got any medical or scientific uh, qualifications. But he was saying, you know, we have to speed up the transition to ESG or to renewable energy by 20 times. We have to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels by a five times faster rate to meet our targets. But in order to do that, you have to set up the infrastructure for renewable energy, which involves a lot of lithium, copper, iron, uh, and a lot of raw materials that have to come out of the ground through use of diesel powered engines and things. So uh, it, there's a non sequitur there at the moment that I'm a little bit concerned about. Okay. Uh, it, you know, to me, when I look at this crisis, there should be an acceleration in transition investments. Uh, you know, to, to break away from uh, dependence on, on uh, in the uh, fossil fuels. But if, I, if I'm an investor sitting in this room, w what would you say would be the best way to get exposure to this? Uh, you know, do I look at equities overseas? Do I look at funds? I mean, how do I get into private equity? How do I get exposure to that? Is it, is it a very difficult thing to do to get exposure to an ESG thematic? Well, I think a lot of people look at ESG as a cost from the fund management point of view, or, or you know, thinking, oh my gosh, we've got to meet all these new requirements for uh, compliance with various ESG rules. Okay. But uh, you know, I think we've been doing it for a while. Uh, we started with governance, then we decided that uh, uh, an equally important factor in the future of a company's uh, performance are matters of climate change and the way people are treated. And we've learned that in Malaysia, to great cost with the likes of uh, Top Glove, uh, uh, Atar, uh, and Syme Derby Plantations and other companies whose exports have been banned probably unfairly by, by the US. So we have to uh, uh, go by those rules. Um, so we have decided that we all on the fund management side, whether it's equities, fixed income, property, uh, look across sectors. We have sector specialists and we you know, discuss regional issues amongst the sector and analysts. And that tends to bring out a few themes uh, and those themes uh, help to identify the area where through ESG, you can get better performance. For example, uh, you know, we looked at uh, uh, the whole electric vehicle business and we decided whether rightly or wrongly that uh, you know, the providers of the chemicals that help make the lithium batteries, et cetera, uh, is the best way to get exposure to this with the best margin. And we needed to play with a large moat uh, uh, and competitive advantage, good cash flow, strong balance sheet. Uh, and we just, we found a thing called LG Chemical. It's not that small a company, <laughs> but uh, you know, that is one way where you can invest to get the best returns for the way the world is transitioning to becoming uh, a, a lower carbon footprint. So some homework to be done, looking at supply chains and how the entire sort of ESG chain works and looking for opportunities within that chain in terms of specific companies. Yeah, got it. Uh, Ridwan, ASEAN, you know, if you're looking at equities, Sharia compliant equities in ASEAN, what's your ranking? What do you like? What, what don't you like? Obviously, we, Maybank, we are very positive when it comes to the overall uh, ASEAN prospect and outlook. As mentioned by Swetlin and Jerry, you know, uh, we have the tailwinds when it comes to the overall broad economic pictures. We have the right ingredients when it comes to demographics and, and, and uh, the right uh, sectors or the right mix between sectors. Uh, obviously, Maybank, uh, you know, um, working for Maybank, uh, who's championing ASEAN as one of the key areas. Obviously, the outlook for ASEAN would be very, very positive. And the challenge for us right now, uh, the asset management side, is actually to produce an investment solutions that is really uh, suited uh, for the ASEAN market. And, and I, I think we cannot run away from, from, uh, from going into the space like the ESG, and we have been doing a lot of work when it comes to ESG and, and, and to make sure that, you know, we, we have the right policy, the right mindset uh, when it comes to the overall ESG. Because, you know, for us, ESG is not just a race, but it's also a journey for, for us uh, when it comes to the uh, overall offerings 
to the ASEAN. Uh, the other areas where I believe that, you know, there would be a lot of demand coming from, from the investors in the ASEAN space would be the other asset, for example, the REITs. Uh, there has been a lot of inquiries from people on the ground in terms of the REITs, uh, specifically for the Sharia related REITs. And also, like I mentioned earlier on, there's always uh, there's also a, a lot of inquiries from people on the ground or investors in the ground when it comes to the new age investments. For example, will there be any uh, quant related Sharia product? Would there be a possibility of developing a Sharia product that's linked to uh, blockchains, for example, uh, cryptos? So these are the areas that we believe that you know we have to do a lot of groundwork and start the ball rolling now rather than later, because if you want to capture the, 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 the bigger pie in ASEAN, which I believe it is possible for us to do, these are the, some of the areas that you need to focus on. Very interesting. Sounds like there's going to be a lot of interesting product development in the pipeline for the Sharia investing space, given all these uh, you know, new asset classes that you're targeting. Okay, last question, and this is going to be a bit of a fun one and a quick one. Say... You woke up tomorrow morning and you found that your bank had deposited a million dollars in your account. It happens in certain banks in Malaysia, not, not Maybank, obviously. So, Jerry, how would you invest that million dollars? I would report to the authorities oh that God. a million ringgit had been <laughs> illegally reported. Uh, I have an account with Maybank, by the way. <laughs> but no, uh, it's a good point. Uh, I, I know you're going to say something about uh, maybe I should get some hair regeneration. Oh, uh, 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 really taking it to heart. But no, I, I do think uh, I'm a naturally conservative investor. I've reached that age when, you know, I don't really want, what well, I'd like, but I, I want more downside protection than massive upside uh, exposure. So for me, you know, gold oh. is, is a very important part of uh, my very small portfolio. I've got a <laughs> safety deposit box with Maybank, actually, with quite a bit of it in it. Um, uh, I also was quite an early adopter of Bitcoin. My average price is 25,000 US dollars. It's getting dangerously close to that. It is. But I think that, I still think the principles of uh, Bitcoin are the right principles. And that is that uh, the developed world central banks have been increasing the supply of fiat money at a ridiculous pace and have really destroyed the credibility of, of, of uh, paper money. So I, I think that could be something that would happen in the future. I think in Malaysia, you've seen how uh, the economy has, you know, the traffic has been terrible uh, ever since uh, uh, movement restrictions have stopped. There is a, a retail boom going on. There's a lot of, you know, leisure uh, uh, and uh, retail uh, to invest in. Property development. I, I've been to the UK, uh, Singapore, Bangkok, Jakarta, uh, Tokyo, Sydney, property market in all these countries is absolutely going crazy. It's yeah. just completely dead here. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's one area where I think banks are now willing to lend and, and people are becoming more and more eligible. The, you know, the rate of growth of applications for loans is growing. I don't think the approval rates increase significantly, but I think the property market in this sector could be uh, uh, very healthy. Um, Electronic manufacturing is somewhere where Malaysia has a competitive advantage against the neighbors and it's not going to go away. We have an ecosystem uh, in and around Penang where you can't set up something to compete with that, rather like Thailand has done with the auto sector. They've got everything from you know, brake lights to you know, sensors, et cetera, up there. So I, I think that's, these are all good areas. And of course, agriculture, I think we import 40% of our food needs. I, I, and I don't think agriculture in this country is seen as a very respectable or, or, or liked profession. In Thailand, it's very different. You get a lot of highly qualified sort of technology-oriented people yeah. going to agriculture. I think there is an area for Malaysia using some of its fallow land to maybe increase its rice production, etc. Interesting. So gold, crypto, retail, property. I assume you mean Malaysian property. Oh, Malaysian property. Malaysian would, yeah. property. EMS companies uh, and agriculture. That last one could be hard to get exposure to, though. But true, they're going to buy farmland or something, maybe. I don't know. Really, one same question. Oh, uh, uh, I would go for mixed asset uh, because uh, I believe that you know the flexibility when it comes to asset allocation is very crucial, especially you know when the overall economic conditions, um, the, the past, you know, in the 
the volatility you know uh, that we have in the market after years of being uh, relaxed when it comes to monetary policy I, I guess going forward you can see a lot more volatility in the market so I'm the kind of guy who always favors for all weather types of um, returns and, and investment solutions. So mixed asset is one of it. Uh, it can be a, a traditional a mixed asset, global mixed asset, or, or the new age, for example, the quant-based mixed asset kind of solutions. Um, again, the justification is simple. You know, uh, when this is all about flexibility, uh, you need to have a flexibility when it comes to your overall investment solutions. Uh, to ensure that you know, the returns are sustainable and also come with much lower risk as compared to uh, if you don't have any flexibility in your investment solutions. And last but not least, if you still have some spare money after investing in mixed asset, of course, I would go for watch. Watch? Wow. What are you wearing now? What do you, what do you tell us? <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> watch is interesting. Yeah, a lot of my friends are into watch trading as well. So. I only hear the good news though. I never heard of a crash in watches. So relatively risk averse, diversified portfolio, uh, mixed asset classes, and watches being the exotic part of it. Swelling. Yeah, one million. That's one. a lot of money, right? In a way, the, the, we, we are still expecting volatility. So I'll be a little bit cautious if I have this one million. However, I will agree with Jerry to go for go. Okay? And I will buy fiscal gold so that I can still wear it, even if it doesn't go. <laughs> so that there is one advantage there. Yeah, we are looking at gold. More from inflation hedge kind of positioning. So whether you want it as physical gold or, or you can buy it buy in terms of uh, the, the, the stock itself. Um, we don't see a recession coming, although there'll be a slowdown with the rate hikes. So we, I, I will be looking opportunity to look to relook at some of the growth stock as well, <laughs> most probably into the software related, data security semicon because as we move on towards the five G, six G, and when we start, or we restarted working from home and all this mobility, I think it will still continue to be there. Um, physical asset, physical, physical asset, yeah, real asset itself. Um, infrastructure trust for some regular income for the time being, yeah, and some commodities that is um, related to um, EV, anything that is more towards the electric vehicle side. Okay. So more forward-looking sort of uh, industries. Oh, very, very inflation sort of uh, defensive gold, physical assets, commodities. Yeah, so it really reflects your your core uh, concerns about inflation, infrastructure trust and software. Yeah, tech is interesting, right? Because these things like 5G, IoT, they're going to happen. You know, yes. you know, you just got to pick the right companies you will survive this, this downturn yes. and you should come out doing, you know, looking pretty good. Right. I'm looking and at, I think yeah, and sorry, one right. last thing is uh, Bitcoin, as Jerry has said. From, from our point, we don't have a Bitcoin-related fund, but on a personal side, my son is invested in Bitcoin. And while it's not for me, I can see the younger generation having an interest there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I've got two more, actually. Uh, Red one reminded me there are the three things that um, Asians have an insatiable appetite for that are limited in supply. One is extremely expensive watches. Uh, <laughs> the, the other two are fish. fish. Okay. Yeah. Uh, marine, you know, okay. uh, 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 and, and durian. And, you know, we were talking before that uh, if China took all Malaysia's durian harvest, it would meet 15% of their total demand. And Malaysian durian is the sort of the cream of the, the crop. So there is exposure to that. There is a plantation, Pahang Plantation Company. I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, we can talk about it later. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Yeah, for sure. So there's only one asset class which overlaps for all three of you. And that's crypto. That's so weird. It's really weird. But interesting. I think we just ran out of time, actually, which is a little embarrassing. I think we don't have time for questions, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm sure you can approach Jerry, Redouan, and Swetling uh, later uh, if you have any uh, pressing questions uh, for them. So I think with that, uh, you know, we'll bring the session to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panel members, uh, Swetling, Jerry, Redouan. Thank you so much for your time and all your valuable insights. Uh, and also thank you to the audience for your attention and questions.
Uh, have a good evening and week ahead. Thank you, Anand and our line of panelists. Now, I would like to welcome Dato Fadil Muhammad, Chief Executive Officer, Maybank Investment Bank Berhad, to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much. That was a very lively session. Dr. Hasnita Hashim, uh, Chairman, Maybank Investment Banking Group. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon to all who are here with us, either virtually or in person at Invest ASEAN Malaysia Life. We are happy to be back in hybrid mode this year after two years of organizing our signature conference virtually. Now it's, it's the seventh year Invest ASEAN seeks to uncover the ASEAN opportunity through conversation with leaders and experts on big questions impacting the region. This morning, we heard from Roger Baker of Stratfor and Dr. Tan Kong Yam of Nanyang Technological University on the Russia-Ukraine conflict and China politics, respectively. From how the COVID pandemic is handled to the US trade war, and now the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we have witnessed how geopolitics has impacted nations, big and small, disrupting supply chains and causing food and energy inflation. While ASEAN has benefited from supply chain relocation and ASEAN markets have been outperforming regional and global benchmarks year to date, the region is not immune to global headwinds. Three major shocks, inflation, impending interest rate, and potential recession will undercut ASEAN's economic recovery in 2022-23. As for Malaysia, Maybank IB's research full year 2.7% full year 2 inflation rate forecast implies monthly inflation rate will climb to over 3% from 2.2% average between January and April. The origin of current inflationary pressure is mainly external, and being a commodity exporter, Malaysia has some fiscal room to provide immediate mitigation measures. Nevertheless, fuel price is a key upside risk. Our economists predict that for every 10 cents per litre of fuel price hike will lift annual inflation rate by 0.3 percentage point. Fruit protectionism can also increase inflationary pressure as 28% of Malaysia's CPI basket of goods and services is on food. Our Malaysia Economy at Crossroads panel earlier this afternoon gave us an idea as to how the central bank, the government and civil society are thinking about managing the country's economic challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, in framing a future for ASEAN and Malaysia that is competitive, inclusive, and equitable, we can turn to sustainability as a key driver of opportunity and a de-risking strategy. According to the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, Sustainable business could open economic opportunities globally worth up to US dollar 12 trillion and increase employment by up to 380 million jobs by 2030. The transition to net zero will require the largest reallocation of capital in history. ASEAN, with its rapid population and healthy GDP growth, is a prime candidate for this capital. There is huge potential for sustainable financing in ASEAN, 
where there is relatively weak supply. Malaysia especially can use its latent expertise in Islamic financing to lead in this issue, in this space particularly. Maybank Investment Bank is actively mobilizing sustainable finance. Firstly, with the setting up of a dedicated sustainable finance team to guide clients end to end from structuring sustainable transactions and connecting them to investors, to assisting them in the compliance of market guidelines and best practices. Secondly, through our engagement with regulators and supranational bodies to help shape policies and develop industry initiatives. I'm pleased to share that we were recently named Best Sustainable Bank in Malaysia by Finance Asia on the back of these efforts. This is just the beginning. We have our work cut for us and we are truly excited by the opportunities ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, as asset allocators and business leaders, we have the ability and the responsibility to drive inclusive and equitable progress. And it pays. Maybank Investment Banking Group Research has found that companies in ASEAN 6 with higher ESG ratings have outperformed the MSCI All Country ASEAN Index by 8.4% year on year and 3.9% per annum for three years to 31st March 2022, respectively. Tomorrow, we have the opportunity to learn about the concept of return on sustainability investment, or ROSI, from Tonsi Whelan of NYU Stern School of Business and Peter, and Peter Grauer, chairman of Bloomberg and founder of the 30% Club USA, will present the case for DEI in winning the war for talent. We hope you will join us virtually tomorrow. Thank you very, very much once again for attending today and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Don't forget we will be on air again tomorrow to discuss more interesting topics. Thank you again for tuning in. Stay safe everyone. Okay, to those of you that are physically here with us today, please join us for some refreshments outside at the Poya area. Thank you. Thank you.